Mike, you're in Australia at the moment because you've guest edited the latest edition of the Aussie surf skate art magazine, Monster Children. How did that all come about? Um, well, Campbell, who is here somewhere, um, was silly enough to call me and uh, ask me, or actually in this day and age, email me and uh, ask me if I wanted to be involved and I was uh, silly enough to say yes. So simple as that. And we, we were introduced by, we had a friend in common named Shelby Mead who's kind of an awesome linker of all um, people. But it's funny because when, when Campbell asked me, I felt like actually, I, I don't know, I kind of had a, a, a kinship with monster children because I feel like they cover music, like kind of what you said, like music, art, you know, visual art, photography, surf, skate, and they, they put it all on the same, kind of like the same playing field or same level, and they kind of cover each thing um, with a good amount of authenticity, yeah. which I think is pretty rare in this day and age. Totally. Um, it's a, a fat addition as well, and it's a real insight into your head and the things you love. You even share like your secret recipe for almond milk. Was that like a, you know, a family recipe or something? Uh, no, not family, but I did. Uh, <laughs> it's actually very controversial in my household because uh, you know, like, one of my kids will not drink almond milk and the other one will. So oh. yeah, we're split right down the middle. Right, right. But um, yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because most people do not mention, I think most people, I don't know, most people don't mention that thing, <laughs> that part of the magazine to me. <laughs> that was the bit that stood out for me because yeah. I thought, oh yeah, surfing, skating, art, cool, I kind of get that. Uh, Almond milk. milk, didn't expect that. Yeah. Nice. It's all part of the, all part of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's even the, the surfing trip with uh, a bunch of your friends and you talk about your playlists in the cars with Spike Jones. So how did that sort of part of it come together? Um, well, in, in, in sort of talking about the magazine with, with Campbell and, and kind of laying out like what we were going to do, obviously we wanted surfing to be part of it and we kept going back and forth with different surfers and, and where, uh, where are we going to go and then it's always a tricky thing because ultimately you have to, you're, you're subject to where you're going to go in the world is kind of like subject to, you have to go where, depending on that time of year, where there's going to be uh, waves. So kind of worked out with uh, Mexico and actually it was a really good eclectic group because then it was uh, I think a good combination of like Spike Jones was able to come down so I, I felt good that to have like a kind of like long time friend collaborator whatever someone equally kind of new to doing a high caliber surf trip along for the whole thing kept it like I think fresh for everybody and then we had Rob Machado who I know but then and then Cassia but then we also had people that we didn't know so it was but they all knew each other so it was kind of like it actually was worked out really great in terms of being this like a uh, group where I think people were really excited to kind of be there together uh, with each other and hopefully it shows um, I might ask you about the band if that's cool um, you guys first came together in New York in 1981 first as a, a punk band yeah I guess 81 82 around there yeah cool um, then what inspired a bunch of you know white guys to transition to hip hop and rap? I think it was kind of, you know, we I grew up like a little punk rock kid, basically, and then, but then also always listened to a lot of different alternative things like like ESG or, or Gang of Four, or The Slits or X Ray Specs, whatever. But but then I don't know. I, I felt like you know we also really liked American hardcore like Black Flag or Dave Kennedy's Minor Threat. But then Bad Brains for sure. But then I kind of feel like, I don't know, with American Hardcore, it kind of became like too, too much the same and too, it was almost like a uniform, you know? You had to have like a leather jacket and blue jeans or whatever. We always wanted, we always liked, with like punk rock, what we liked is things were always changing and always different. And as soon as we heard, all heard like rap music, especially once like rap records started to come out, we would just memorize every word of every rap record that we could possibly get and then uh it was like we realized we were spending more of our time listening to that and doing that than we were with like our you know with like hardcore records or punk rock records or whatever yeah so we just kind of went with that like we never really thought like oh we can't do this we always just felt like okay i guess we we could um you guys have always been musically adventurous was that just you know keeping it fun for yourselves like i i think in a lot of ways, like we were lucky as a group because it was kind of like we basically just were 
DJs in a way, or 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 we're like record collectors that we were able to like use our record collection into like influencing and, and making that part of what we would make every time. And then I think also we were really lucky to grow up at a time in New York where you had like all this different music happening at the same time, whether it was like, like you know, we talked about like hardcore and punk rock and hip hop. And then, but then at the same time you hear Latin music and you hear it like, it would, it would all, you know, jazz of course comes from New York. You'd all, you'd hear everything kind of all at once. So it always just seemed natural to us to put all those things together or, or actually dance hall and reggae too. I forgot about that. Like that, yeah. that was always a influence. Like I remember early on being like a huge Clash fan because like the Clash like reggae, then I kind of discovered reggae and was like, oh, okay, that's like another music that I can like along with punk rock and hip hop the same way. But then I th feel like when we, we were kind of influenced like that because then I felt like, then when we became a band, we kind of felt like, okay, we saw how the Clash could kind of lead the way like that. I mean, not that they're a great band, so I'm not trying to put ourselves in high uh, esteem like the Clash, but I'm just saying, like they they were they were like kind of effective messengers or communicators about like getting people into other kinds of music like that, and I think that kind of cued us a little bit on that. Um, and you release so many classic music videos, and so many of them are really entertaining and often really funny as well. Was, was that? Do you think that was part of why you guys had such broad appeal? Um, I, mean, I don't know why. I, like, I don't know why. It's not for me to say why people liked us or didn't like us or hated us or liked us, whatever. But I think um, it's funny that I think we grew up, as much as we grew up on like the, what we've been talking about musically, I think we also grew up in a weird way on, com on like the, all, there are all these comedies we watch all the time, like with like, with like Chevy Chase and Bill Murray and that whole kind of like era of like, I don't know, like Caddyshack and Stripes and Meatballs. Yeah. <laughs> like films like that and so that was always a big influence for us and so yeah. that was always just that just felt natural or that like, kind of felt like that's what we came from ah that, that, yeah that's interesting because often you know you're sort of set up as the pranksters in a lot of the music videos like especially in fight for your right you know you're there invading the the geeks kind of party and it, yeah it looked like you were having fun as well yeah well, but yeah, definitely that was inspired by like just growing up, like, wa like watching those comedies like over and over and over again, like probably way too many times. <laughs> um, Fight for Your Right definitely became a party anthem. Was it always intended to be? Um, no, I mean, well, I guess it's cool that it was. We, we were just kind of like what you were saying before, we were just joking around. You know, for us, it was kind of like, that was like a, us thinking like, oh, wouldn't it be really funny if we made a record like this to them making a record like that? But then we never really thought that people would take it seriously. And it wasn't until it was, it's funny because we kind of recorded it as a, as a demo and then, but then once it was like mixed properly, it actually sounded like a real record. And when, I remember we were all kind of like a little bit shocked. Like we were like, wow, this, this, this sounds like something you could actually hear on the radio and then than it was. You're a band that has stood for things as well. So, you know, Tibetan human rights, you released an anti-Iraq war protest song. Do you see music as kind of a force for political change or getting messages out there? Yeah, I, I just think music is an incredible medium for communicating emotion and feelings about things. So it, and it has this unique way of like resonating with people. And so I think there's, like I'm, I've always been like a huge fan of groups like The Clash or Public Enemy, or you know, I, I kind of like put them all in, in the same category of groups that like are able to make incredible music. But part of what makes their music is incredible is that they're able to speak on things and 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 say really important things. And you're a band that's taken a real anti-commercial stance as well. So you don't like your music being used in ads. So I, I read recently that you um, knocked back a bunch of cash from Arnold Schwarzenegger to have sabotage used in a, a big blockbuster action film. Why have you taken that kind of stance? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. You know, it's, it's kind of like, I think we, we're always like, I mean, it's one thing with, with films because those are creative things. So usually we try to say yes to films using our music if we, if we can. But it just feels like, I don't know, we grew up maybe in a different time, but 
and we, you know, we're really fortunate because we're, we grew up at a time where when you could sell records, so you, you, you know, we have the luxury of being able to say no to um, some licenses. But I don't know, it just kind of feels like there's a certain, I don't want to be too precious about it, but like a purity in that, like we, we always made music because we love making music and it wasn't for it wasn't ever made with the intention of like I don't know, selling like a specific uh product or something of course you, you tragically lost mca a couple of years ago to cancer um are you wrapping up the beastie boys out of respect for him um i mean it's just more i guess i don't know if it's like out of respect or so much i mean of course of course we have incredible respect for yeah but it's kind of like the the band is a unique combination of people you know and it was a, it was the combination of all our efforts and how our voices intertwined and what our opinions were and what would happen in a, in a room kind of between the three of us so without that and without that uh group of people you just don't you don't have it you know it doesn't exist anymore and, and did ha did adam have in his will that he doesn't want music to be used in commercials or for commercial purposes yeah i, I feel like i'm uh, back on the witness stand now but um <laughs> but yeah, yes no he he you know that was a really important um thing to to yeah you know and that was like an important stance and we just you know really it was important to us to kind of honor that and how does it feel to be ending the band uh, well, you know, I think we're, we're for both Adam and I, we're sad, you know, we're, we're sad about it, but we feel good about what we've, what we've done, you know, and want to kind of like continue to manage what exists um, well, but, um, and also feeling really, really grateful that we kind of got to have this adventure, you know, all being like kind of with our friendships intact and uh, staying still excited about what we were doing. You guys were one of the longest running hip hop bands of all time. What do you see as your legacy? Ooh, I, I don't know, I guess it's probably not for me to say, like as we were just um, kind of doing what we uh, felt <laughs> good about doing, but um, I don't know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we um, made some music that people continue to enjoy and and uh get something out of in the future and and uh yeah